So without further ado, um, we're gonna announce our first talk. Um, it's um, being given by Dr. Nora Turo, who's the Chief of GI and Liver Disease at my, my institution, USC. And she's gonna be giving a t state of the art talk on what I think is probably has been the holy grail of liver disease worldwide forever, and that's curing hepatitis B. So. Uh, so thanks, Jeff, for uh, the introduction. And I want to say how wonderful it is to be here and to see so many familiar faces. Wow, it's just remarkable. Um, I want to thank the organizers for making it a hybrid meeting um, and giving us this opportunity to get together. Um, I'm also super excited to give you a, an update, really, on, um, I'm, I call it state of HBV cure. Um, and hopefully over the, the next um, 40 minutes or so, you'll understand sort of where we're at. These are my disclosures. So you're all very aware that our current therapies for hepatitis B are actually um, a targeted approach. You know, our goals with current therapy are to pre prevent HBV complications. Um, and so we're targeting those that are at risk for disease progression. And that falls into really two large buckets those that have active chronic hepatitis B defined by an ALT elevation and elevated HPV DNA, and those that have advanced fibrosis. We also have other special groups, co-infected patients, um, those on immune modulatory therapy, and we also treat some uh, women in pregnancy. But largely we're focused on, on this active chronic hepatitis B. So what that means is we have two other larger groups that we don't treat currently with um, at least via guidelines, and those are individuals who have inactive uh, chronic hepatitis B, where their HPV DNA levels are low or undetectable, and their ALT levels are normal, and immune tolerant uh, individuals. Now with the, our current therapies, you know that we also have three excellent drugs, um, Intecavir, uh, TDF, and TAF, um, are all very well tolerated and have um, excellent both efficacy and safety profiles. So truthfully, choosing among these three is really a little bit of personal choice to some extent, uh, although there are some recommendations in terms of who should get what drug. If you have a patient with no comorbidities, any of the three would be excellent. In general, if you're somebody who's over the age of 60 or has either bone or renal disease, then you should avoid TDF. So TAF and Intecavir are the drugs of choice. For those with HIV co-infection, generally a, a tenofovir-based therapy is recommended, and, and a lot of the combination treatments for HIV uh, indeed include that. Um, and anybody with prior uh, lamivudine exposure also should not uh, receive Intecavir. And then in, in pregnancy, we're recommending at the moment only TDF. But generally, excellent drugs. And what we also know is that when we use those very excellent drugs um, and use them in the way that we've been guided by the guidelines, meaning those with active disease and those with advanced fibrosis, that we can achieve very remarkable outcomes. Sustained HPV DNA suppression is associated with lower rates of cirrhosis, fibrosis progression. You can reverse liver decompensation. There's remarkable data to show reductions in HCC, liver-related mortality, and survival. So we have very good drugs that we're working with. And I think one of the most remarkable is just its impact on liver cancer. And I just show you one study. There are many. Here we're looking at intecavir-treated patients versus untreated controls um, with a, a follow-up period of, of up to seven years. And you can see that there's a significant risk reduction in those that are treated with intecavir. So indeed, most of the time when I'm talking to patients about uh, treatment and its benefits, I quote a number of 70% reduction in risk for liver cancer. So that's a, probably one of the most remarkable aspects of what we have. Uh, but the unfortunate thing with NA therapy is that it very infrequently results in S antigen loss. So shown here are sort of a summary of the rates of S antigen loss. So what you can see is that in E antigen positive patients, you tend to lose um, S antigen loss more frequently. With PEG interferon, it's about 10% of the time with a course of treatment, and with NAs with follow-up of up to sort of five years, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of sort of four to maybe 8%. 
Um, in E antigen negative chronic hepatitis B, it, it almost never happens, essentially. So that's really quite remarkable that we have this huge population that we're treating with NA, but we're very infrequently getting S antigen loss. And as we talk about functional cure, you'll see that that becomes really very important. And, and we, we know now that while suppression of HBV DNA is very good, loss of surface antigen is even better. And so again, focusing on HCC as the outcome um, shown in this large Hong Kong cohort, uh, what you see in the figure is that the patients um, that lose surface antigen on NA therapy has the very lowest rate of HCC. That's shown at the very bottom, 0.5%. In contrast to the patients that remain on NA therapy, are, but are suppressed. It's lower than if they were untreated, but still the very best outcomes are achieved with surface antigen loss. So we now understand that while suppression is good and we've achieved many things with suppression, that getting to surface antigen loss is even better. So that really is the, the impetus behind this push for new therapies. Um, recognizing the limits of our current therapies, which include the fact that NA therapy is long-term. Patients need to be on often lifelong. But it's really this idea that they're losing S antigen infrequently. So it's not curative. And, um, you know, when I talk to patient advocates, they also emphasize that, you know, loss of surface antigen is a very important thing for an individual who's infected in terms of destigmatization. And then I think the other thing that really has fueled the HBV field is the fact that we have so much success with HCV. If you go back 10, years ago or 15 years ago, we would never have believed we could cure essentially everybody with hep C. And now we've done it. And so I think looking for that for our hepatitis B patient is now really the future. So but before I start, I just want to kind of acquaint you with the various definitions of cure, because the, we use the term now very frequently, uh, but we actually parse it out into different definitions. So I just want to kind of get you all on the same page. So um, if we, sh we look here, Partial cure is what we're currently obtaining. So partial cure is a patient who has an undetectable HBV DNA, uh, but still is surface antigen positive. So that's the vast majority of the patients that we are treating. We're very effectively reducing their HBV DNA, but they're still surface antigen positive. That is termed partial cure now. When you lose surface antigen, that moves you into functional cure. And that's shown in, in the, the next box. But you'll notice at the bottom um, that the form of covalently closed circular DNA that exists within the nucleus of hepatocytes remains even in individuals who have functional cure because our current NA therapies don't, do not eliminate uh, that form of the virus, cannot access the virus that's within the nucleus, and so CCC DNA remains. And as you know, that CCC DNA is the substance which sort of puts individuals at risk for reactivation. So obviously, we'd also like to get rid of the CCC DNA, and if we get to that point, if we could just go back, it's moving on its own, that would be called a complete cure. So whether we can get to complete cure or not is, I think, I think we will get there, but I think current therapies are, are not really aiming for that. And then finally, what sterilizing cure? Sterilizing cure is when we also get rid of the integrated HPV DNA. Because we do know that individuals who are chronically infected do integrate the, the virus into the host genome. And so ultimately, sterilizing cure is defined by losing, also eliminating the integrated HPV DNA. And at least currently, the reason we're focused on functional cures, that's really accessible to us I, with the, the current treatments that we're looking at. Um, sterilizing or complete cure are not thought to be within early reach, although I would say that we're hopeful that in the future we'll also be able to achieve that as well. So when you hear people talk about cure, they're actually referring to functional cure, which is this loss of surface antigen. So in addition to uh, focus in the new therapies on functional cure, part of it is also that the, the treatment will be finite and that you're gonna achieve this and be off treatment. Because a lot of what we do now is we're getting very good results, but people remain on treatment. So the aspects of cure that we're talking about is more surface antigen loss, doing it with finite treatment, and, doing, and being able to come off treatment and be off treatment. So that's sort of the triple goals. So are we uh, close to cure um, today? The answer is no. But, but are, are we getting closer? For sure we are. Um, and what I want to focus on in the remainder of my talk is sort of where we are. I'm going to look a little bit at the novel therapies, 
I'm also going to look at other ways that we can use current therapies to get more functional cure. All right. So to set the stage for the new therapies, I think it's important to highlight that the barriers to functional cure are really twofold. And you're going to see as drug development is going on that they're really in two large camps. Um, one of them is we have a very high viral burden, um, and so we have a lot of direct-acting antivirals now that are focused on reducing viral burden, both antigen and virus, uh, in terms of H uh, HPV um, DNA. But we also have a, a weak immune response. That also is critical in terms of why we aren't seeing more functional cure. So the other arm of, of drug development is around uh, immune modulatory therapies. So this is a pretty busy cartoon, uh, but it really highlights all of the drug classes that are currently in development. And I'm just going to sort of walk you through what they are, not just to so you sort of get familiar with the terms. Um, but what you can see, I wanted to highlight, is that you can see there's the immune modulatory camp of drugs is actually quite robust. You know, we also we have checkpoint inhibitors that I'm going to show you a little bit of data about that look very very interesting. We're seeing other drugs that blockade the immune uh, suppressive effects because we know that chronic HBV is in itself immunosuppressive. So releasing sort of um, that, that immune suppression is, is key. There's also very uh, interesting vaccine therapies that are targeting the T cell responses. And we also know that uh, the toll-like receptors are very important in terms of both it, uh, primarily the innate uh, immune responses and that um, TLR agonists um, have a potential role to play in enhancing immune responses. I'm only going to show you uh, data on the uh, checkpoint inhibitors, but to know that there are many other classes of immune modulatory therapies that are in development. Um, what you've probably heard more about are the direct acting antivirals. Um, and just kind of walking you through the viral life cycle, you can see that we're targeting many different steps now. Um, we have entry inhibitors, and in fact, entry inhibitors um, are being used also for hepatitis D. And, um, and actually, this is probably going to be the first, one of the first drug classes that you're going to see come into clinical practice is this entry inhib inhibition. Um, we also have drugs that, um, are, that they're very early in development, but targeting that CCC DNA that I said was so important in terms of us getting to a, a complete cure. Um, we have drugs that target... Um, the transcription of the virus, so RNA interfering drugs. It's interesting, I think it's on some kind of automatic here. If we could just go back. Let me see if I can make it go back. Thank you. Um, and then uh, you also have um, capsid uh, assembly modulators or CAMs that are in, in production. And then finally, we have drugs that interfere with the release of the virus. I'm going to show you several of the drug classes here. I'm going to focus on uh, a study that uses RNA interference, um, one that uses um, uh, drugs that interfere with release of virus. But just to give you a flavor of what's out there, I can't possibly cover all the drugs. There are more than 50 drugs that are in various phases of development, some sort of preclinic till to phase three. But what we care about typically as we're looking at drug development is how many of them have got beyond phase one that are where they're doing human studies where they're looking at safety and efficacy where we're really getting closer, and more than 25 drugs are beyond phase one. So it tells you it's a very robust field. Um, and I just want to, you know, I've shown you sort of the, the immune modulatory and then there's the direct antiviral uh, drugs. And really, uh, the, the way that these drugs are working is really uh, in one of three ways, and sometimes they work by more than one. But but there's drugs that work primarily to inhibit the viral replication. That's our current NAs, that's how they work. But also entry inhibitors and the CAMs sort of focus primarily on reducing viral replication. And then there are other drugs which work primarily to reduce the viral burden, so all of the, the antigens as well as HPV DNA. And that's where we're seeing a lot of interest uh, and activity related to silencing RNAs uh, and, and other classes. That's interesting. Could you just go back? Thanks. Can we just go back two slides, please? It's a little bit tricky for me up here. Can we just, the reverse button's not working for me. One more. Thank you. 
All right, um, and so uh, reducing viral antigen is important, so the siRNAs, uh, ASOs are big in that group. And then I've already highlighted this boosting of the immune responses. So really when you see new drugs and you're sort of trying to understand how, how are they working, how are they coming together, um, they really fall into one of these three camps. And the, the, I think, emerging theme as we look to the new therapies and what I'm going to demonstrate in the studies that I do share with you today is now we recognize you're not just going to use one, that the combinations are really going to be the winner here. And I think most of us believe that it's not going to be a single drug that's going to get us to functional cure. It's really going to be combinations of drugs that get us there. Okay. So I'm going to start by uh, just sharing a few studies um, that highlight um, where we're going with new therapies. So this is a triplet, so we're using NA. So very often these drugs use patients who are already on an NA and suppressed. Um, and what they're using here is nucleic acid polymers which interfere or block viral release. So it's one of the, it's the only drug in that class uh, currently. And then they also use PEG interferon here as an immune modulatory therapy. Um, and what you can see in this study here is that um, they, they had a, a lead-in period where the, they had the NA, then they added PEG interferon, which is in blue, and then uh, the NAP, finally. And what you can see when you look at the surface antigen um, and HBV DNA level shown in the graphics on the left is that when they use, when they add um, the interferon and then the NAP in particular, there's this dramatic reduction in the hepatitis B surface antigen levels. Uh, really quite remarkable, as well as HPV DNA. And they treated these patients for uh, a period of 48 weeks. Uh, it's not an easy therapy because they're getting weekly infusions. Uh, but look at the outcome here. In, in that nearly over 50% of the patients lost surface antigen with this 48 weeks of treatment. So it is kind of getting at what we want, right? It's finite therapy, high rates of surface antigen loss, uh, but it is not exactly easy, right? Weekly infusions is not easy. And they had AST, ALT elevations in commonly occurring during treatment, although they weren't associated with bilirubin elevations. But to give you a sense of this is the direction we're going, this is what is achievable with some of the new drugs we're looking at. Now, um, the company that makes uh, the, these, the nucleic acid polymers just announced that they now have a sub-Q version of this that they're going to be testing. So you can see that this is moving forward. Uh, but this is sort of one of the most exciting drugs in terms of the proportion of patients that achieve surface antigen loss with this combination therapy. But keep in mind, we're using many arms of you know, reducing viral replication, re reducing viral antigen load, boosting the immune response to get to surface antigen loss. Now I can't move forward. If we could just go back, because it somehow skipped two slides. <laughs> I'm having a little bit of trouble here. Can you just go back two slides? One more. One more. One more. <laughs> OK, great, perfect. So we're going to do them a little out of order, but it's still um, important to show you these um, new data. So here is a, 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 not a triplet, but a doublet. Uh, using an NA with an anti pdl one inhibitor. So this is very recent data presented at the ASLD. Um, it's a phase 2B trial uh, being conducted in China. 149 patients that they plan to include, of which they had data on 44 that they presented. This is also a therapy that's given um, subcutaneously, so parenterally, uh, every two weeks, and um, the, we're only looking at the lowest dose here. Um, at baseline, these patients are E-antigen negative, have a surface antigen level less than uh, 10,000, and an HBV DNA level less than 20. So they were suppressed. Um, so what you can see when you look at the table on the right is uh, the mean reduction in surface antigen from baseline when they looked at um, these patients after 24 weeks is modest, a 0.38 uh, log reduction. But log reductions are, are really a, a high bar. Most of the studies use a bar of at least a 0.5 log reduction to sort of see meaningful changes. And you can see that about one of five achieved that. And they had three patients that lost surface antigen. Um, when they focused on the patients that had a lower HBV surface antigen level at baseline, you can see that the proportions increased. So if you look at the bottom half of the table, 
um, in that group of patients that had a lower uh, surface antigen level to start, they had up to 44% uh, of, of patients who achieved that 0.5 log reduction, and again, three patients that lost surface antigen. And the three patients that lost surface antigen are shown at the bottom. Um, so again, these are short courses of treatment. We're getting, you know, a, a modest proportion of patients losing surface antigen. Um, and you can see that in each case, there's an ALT uh, elevation that accompanies that loss of surface antigen. Um, so ALT flares are something that you're going to hear a lot more about because that is sort of the Achilles heel of how we're moving forward with treatment is we have to manage flares because often clearance and achievement of surface antigen um, requires that or at least it seems to be linked with that. But exciting data, because anti-PD-1s, we have quite a few of those drugs around, so sort of looking at how these are going to be used potentially to help patients get to surface antigen loss is pretty exciting. Could you advance the next slide? I'm afraid to hit it twice because it might skip. Just to, thank you. Um, the last uh, new trial, a new study that I want to share with you is, again, a triplet. So I showed you a triplet in which we used an NA, a nucleic acid polymer, and peg interferon. Here we're really uh, using a silencing RNA. So this is a, a new form, a new class of drugs, but many drugs in this category. And um, in this case, they're uh, very interestingly looking at sort of the timing of when you add the peg interferon. So this was another uh, drug, uh, drug study that was presented at ASLD. So the way that the silencing RNAs work is they block the production of, of most of the viral transcripts. So they really sort of block production of most of the HBV genes. And in doing so, bring down both HBV DNA levels, HBV RNA levels, and antigen production. So kind of a, a nice way to sort of bring antigen and viral loads down. So what you can see in this uh, study is they did um, the drug VIR2218 alone. They did it where they added peg interferon right from the beginning, and then they did it where they added the peg interferon after 12 weeks of the VIR2218 alone. And what this study showed is the very best results in terms of, again, a log reduction in the surface antigen. Can we go back? I mean, like, it's a, it's a challenge for me. And maybe I have to speak faster, perhaps. Uh, we can just go back one slide for me, please, just to finish off that one. One back. Thank you. So what you can see here is that the very best result is where they did peg interferon and the VR2218 right from the beginning. Notice, again, um, that they're using short course of treatment, going for that finite treatment. Uh, but interestingly, using peg interferon as immune modulatory seems to be important, and having it right from the beginning seems to be relevant here. Um, so this is one more class, giving you a sense of how they're using these drugs in combination and how these drugs are really driving towards that loss of surface antigen. In this particular study, uh, of 48 patients, three patients during their 24 weeks lost surface antigen, um, and they had AEs that were primarily related to peg interferon. So really just a flavor of where we are and what we can look forward to in the future. Look for more combination therapies. So just to summarize the novel HBV therapies, you should take away from this, this talk that there's a very rich pipeline. I'm showing you just you know, a few of the many studies that have been done. Um, they're largely divided into groups of drugs that inhibit viral replication, bring down viral antigen load, and boost the immune response, and expect to see more of those combination therapies. Um, most of the studies are using NA-suppressed patients, uh, but increasingly they're moving towards also considering treating groups of patients that we typically don't treat, the inactive chronic hepatitis B and even immune-tolerant patients. I think the key for the drug development is how best to combine these drugs, um, and I think the increasing recognition of the importance of immune modulatory therapy um, is really coming forward in many of the studies, so expect to see peg interferon be part of the armamentarium, at least in the short term. Okay, so I'm gonna shift now to thinking about how do you get to functional cure with what we have now? And there's two strategies that have been really a, lot, a, fair, lot, a fair amount of data. One is the NA withdrawal in E antigen negative chronic hepatitis B, and the second is a peg, ad, a peg interferon add-on. And I'm gonna focus first on the NA withdrawal. So just to make the point that um, currently the AASLD, at least, doesn't recommend doing withdrawal of therapy. We recommend, we meaning, the, I speak for ASLD, I guess, um, 
in, as, a, as, a, as an ASLD um, um, individual who follows those guidelines, I don't withdraw uh, because the guideline says we should treat indefinitely. But know that easel and apostle are quite different and they're really driving the agenda with respect to learning more about how to do withdrawal. Easel recommends that you can with, do withdrawal after you've had somebody on suppressive therapy for three years, um, and Apozal indicates that you can do it after uh, two years of, of uh, therapy and an undetectable HPV DNA. Note that um, it's not recommended that we do this in patients with cirrhosis, um, but, but it, it is this movement towards withdrawal. And what do we know about um, the withdrawal is that um, when you do it, this is sort of the typical natural history. So if you withdraw someone after some prolonged period of suppression, there's usually a lag of a few months where nothing happens. Then you, if they're going to um, relapse uh, or, uh, or reactivate, you'll see the HPV DNA go up followed closely by ALT levels. This reactivation phase can last months to up sometimes even a year, and sometimes it doesn't settle down. It just goes on and they have very active disease and you have to reinitiate treatment. But in, in a proportion of patients, after that reactivation, they settle down, they consolidate, and if you wait long enough, and these are studies that look at outcomes at three years, um, up to 20% of them will have lost surface antigen, and uh, a further 50% will be inactive chronic hepatitis B. So that's a, that's a great outcome, right? You have patients that you had on NA therapy and now having withdrawn them, you've identified patients who don't need it, those inactive chronic hepatitis B, and 20% of them, up to 20%, have lost surface antigen. So this gained a fair amount of traction after this published, there was a, an early study that gave this 20% uh, result, and that sort of drove a lot of studies to further look at this. Um, but what I uh, want to emphasize is that the withdrawal does seem to be important. So this is uh, the only one of the few randomized trials in which you can see stopping TDF versus continuing it is important in terms of driving down the surface antigen and ultimately leading to loss. So it is something is happening by doing withdrawal. It is beneficial in terms of changing the trajectory in terms of surface antigen decline. But the challenge is that um, there's a lot of heterogeneity. So now there's been a lot of studies published. I show you here only the ones that have uh, studies of at least 20 patients in them or more. And there's been, you know, there continue to be more studies published. You can see that um, there's the follow-up um, in these studies is sometimes only, um, you know, up to two or three years. Sometimes they're much longer. The NAs that are used are quite heterogeneous. But what I want to focus on is how often do you get surface antigen loss? And you can see that it varies from zero. There's some studies where they don't get any S antigen loss, and some as high as, you know, 50%. The median comes back to that 20% number. So when I'm talking about this really with patients who are inquiring, that's usually what I use is to quote a 20% likelihood of success. Um, the success, that heterogeneity I showed you where it can be as low as zero and up to 50% and somewhere in the middle is probably where the real number is, is because we have a lot of heterogeneity in the patients that are being withdrawn. Heterogeneity in terms of what their baseline characteristics are, their age, their sex, their genotype, but also we probably, the NA therapy that we're that receiving matters, how long they've been on the NA therapy, how long they've had an HBV DNA that's undetectable, all influence kind of the success. And the other thing is that the criteria for restarting treatment, when somebody's having that ALT elevation, how long do you wait before you restart, influences the outcome. And that is highly variable across studies. And so as a consequence, it's hard to know how to take that information we're seeing and then apply it in a guidance fashion to how you think about doing withdrawal. Um, I think one of the interesting things that I've kind of come to, uh, to work wonder about is, do you need to get the ALT flare? And it turns out when you look at patients who are being withdrawn, there's actually sort of two groups. There's a group that at the end of treatment has already a low S antigen level, and if you withdraw them, they just continue to decline over time and eventually lose surface antigen, and they don't get an ALT flare. And then there's a group that gets that whole flare, um, and then ultimately loses surface antigen. And sort of if you look at it that way, um, it's very interesting. So it turns out, and this is one study to show it, they're looking here at who had a clinical relapse and a virological relapse and who did not. Um, and what you see here is this group that has the highest rate of surface antigen seroclearance, so that lost surface antigen, is actually the group that didn't get a clinical and virological relapse. 
So actually the very best patient to do withdrawal in is the patient that already is pretty low and is just gonna to continue to lose when you stop treatment. It's not to say you can't get loss via this ALT flare mechanism, but to know that it happens actually less frequently. So indeed, it's the surface antigen level that is your best predictor of withdrawal. And so this study, uh, I'm showing you two different ones on the left, is really looking at quantitation of surface antigen, and this is something that you can order, that you can measure, because we have this available. It shows that, um, in general, those that have levels, it, it depends on the study, but generally a level of 100 or less, that individual has a very high likelihood of losing surface antigen when you stop treatment. And so that's a patient who's well-suited for withdrawal. And this systematic review of 11 studies um, actually also arrived at that same kind of concept, in that it's the level of surface antigen that is going to influence your likelihood of having success when you stop treatment. So I think if you're an individual who's contemplating using the withdrawal strategy, the quantitative surface antigen is your best uh, guide to whether you should do withdrawal. Um, but know that you're going to still have a risk potentially of ALT flares that has to be monitored very actively. And there's some um, interesting, I think, applications now that are saying, well, can we do more to predict? And I, th I thought this was a very interesting uh, result because it's sort of bringing in other things. It looked not only at the surface antigen quantitation, but it also looked at what was the total duration of treatment, how long were they consolidated. Consolidated means here, how long were they HPV DNA negative before you took them off treatment? And you can see here, this is looking at clinical relapse, that the lowest rate of clinical ra relapse in this group was those that had a low surface antigen level, had been on treatment for two to three years at least, and had been consolidated for at least two years. So this is you know, a, your, a data coming from Asia where they do a lot of stopping after two years of treatment. And so this idea that longer periods of being on treatment, longer periods of being consolidated before you withdraw, also is gonna help you. So looking at all those aspects before you decide about withdrawal is important. And the other thing is that there's new markers. So these aren't you know, available to us yet through Quest or LabCorp or whatever your lab is, but they're coming. There are other new markers, and one of the most exciting ones, I think, is correlated antigen, because it's a serological test. And this is just to show you that there are other studies that are incorporating correlated antigen into this prediction of who does well when you do withdrawal. So in this um, study, which they came up with the acronym of SCALE-B, they're using surface antigen quant, correlated levels, um, age, ALT, and whether patients were on tenofovir and tecovir to ultimately refine who should be withdrawn. So you can see that we're getting much better at this. That's the bottom line, that we're going to get more clear at being able to know who should we withdraw in a way that's going to really minimize harm. So just to summarize this NA withdrawal, um, it's not in the guidelines, but <laughs> um, I do know that people always ask about it, so I think we just have to understand where we're at with it. Recognize that the, um, the benefit of NA withdrawal in terms of getting to functional cure is quite modest probably at best 20% with three to five years of follow-up will achieve surface antigen loss. That is higher than if you keep them on an NA for sure. If you keep them on an NA, it's pretty much close to zero. So it's a definite treatment benefit, but it's modest. And remember that these ALT flares result in really, can result in clinical decompensation. It's been reported patients have actually had to have transplants related to withdrawal treatment. So just be aware. The main drivers of the heterogeneity and the outcomes I highlighted for you is really, I think, related to the duration of treatment and the HPV DNA suppression, as well as sort of when you intervene with retreatment. And if you're going to undertake this, I would highly recommend you look carefully at your quantitative surface antigen as a guide, and also duration of treatment and duration of HPV DNA suppression. And be on the lookout, because I'm sure in the next, uh, in the near future, we'll have more tools in our toolbox to help us, such as correlated antigen. So I'm going to close with just a little bit about PEG interferon. So I know for those of you that are as old as I am, you've done PEG interferon treatment for both C and maybe even hepatitis B. And just to know, it's coming back. <laughs> You're going to see it. Um, it's, it's the immune modulatory therapy that really is working. So I'm going to show you some data where we're seeing now um, interest in sort of add-on strategies. So this is really just a, a diagram to say that um, there are two kind of strategies you can look at in terms of um, 
potentially using PEG interferon. And they've been uh, both uh, reported, and I want to just highlight uh, one study that's been done recently, which I think is the best. So one strategy is you have your NA-treated patients, um, and you add on PEG interferon for some duration of time. And most of the studies use 24 to 48 weeks of PEG interferon. The other strategy is you have somebody who's NA treated and you switch them. So you stop the NA and you start PEG interferon. And sometimes there's a little overlap period. So those have been called the add-on and the switch strategies. Um, in a recent uh, systematic review that looked at what's the frequency of S antigen loss when you undertake switch and add-on strategies in E antigen negative patients, you can see that the proportion that lose surface antigen at the end of the PEG interferon period, 14% with the switch therapy, 8% with the add-ons, uh, this is in a, a meta-analysis, 8% with the add-on. So I'll just have those numbers in mind. Remember that those are numbers that are higher than if you were to continue the NA alone. Remember, NA alone in E antigen negative patients is a 0% rate of S antigen loss. So it's, it is a modest increase. So there is some enthusiasm for this PEG interferon add-on switch idea. But there's been, there was always, the studies that have been done have been small, and that I just showed you results from a systematic review, and what we really needed was a good randomized control trial. And it finally got done. It was published this year. It's called the SWAP study. So it's a, a study in which the patients had to be on NA therapy for at least 12 months, be HPV DNA negative, and then they were randomized to either get this add-on or switch. Um, in this case, they're using peg alpha-2b, uh, for 48 weeks. And then they also had a control group, of course, that continued the NA therapy. And just to highlight, um, this is a study done, a multi-center study. They're mostly Asian, um, Chinese, actually, in this case, uh, patients. Um, you can see that they had a very modest number that had cirrhosis. Um, they had some that were E-antigen positive and some that were E-antigen negative. Um, and um, you can see that um, the years on treatment was actually much more than the, the minimum requirement of one year, that most of them had been on treatment for six to seven years. All right, so let me show you the results first for the E antigen negative patients. So now they, they treat them for 48 weeks, so um, either as an add-on or switch strategy, and then 24 weeks after completing this period of peg interferon, they're looking at the outcomes. So it's a bit of a busy slide, but um, focus first on functional cure, because this is the talk today. And what you can see is that they, um, both with the switch and the add-on strategy, 12% of the patients lost surface antigen. And again, that was statistically higher than continuing NA therapy alone, which is zero, as I highlighted as I was the case. Um, and they also had you know, individuals that had a, a greater than one log decline in their surface antigen. That was also higher. Um, in the treated patients that got PEG interferon, um, and um, there was no statistical difference between switch versus add-on. What mattered in terms of switch versus add-on was the frequency of getting uh, virological relapse and clinical relapse, and this shouldn't uh, surprise us because the add-on therapy, the NA, is still there, so much less likely to get a virological relapse. So that's where they showed that if you do a switch strategy, you're much more likely to get ALT elevations and virological relapse, um, and that was shown to be significantly different. Can we just advance to the next slide, please? I'm always nervous about hitting the button more than once. Okay. And then it, they also had E antigen positive patients. So um, these are individuals in which um, I think right now we don't have any indication typically to do any peg interferon add-on, but look at what they achieved here by doing that. So in the uh, patients that had add-on or switch, um, basically one in four uh, achieve surface antigen loss by adding on PEG interferon. And again, compared to NA treated patients whom, whom they continued, in which zero of them uh, during this time achieved surface antigen loss. So a significant difference. Again, the difference between the switch versus the add-on strategy is there's a much higher rate of virological and clinical relapse in the switch strategy. And for all of those reasons, the SWAP study concluded that PEG interferon was um, a benefit in terms of achieving functional cure in E antigen positive and E antigen negative patients, but that the preferred strategy was add-on because of the sort of minimizing harm. So that's what it says at the bottom. And just to say that, you know, you think this is sort of like, oh, that's kind of interesting, but not for me. <laughs> um, just to say a puzzle is like kind of ahead of us. So a puzzle is actually already incorporated these elements into a new guideline. So this is a new guidance that was put out by the Asian Pacific Association for the Study of Liver Disease in which they're giving guidance on how to stop nukes. 
So just to take you through it, because it incorporates many of the things that I've just highlighted for you, that they've now kind of embraced this, and it's now in guidance. So what they recommend is if you have a patient that is um, on NA therapy, this would be somebody who's E-antigen negative and suppressed, if they have a surface antigen level that is under 100, you should stop. So that's going along with that data I showed you that surface antigen quant is the best marker for telling you whether you should withdraw. So in that case, they say, stop your nuke. You're in good shape. Now, if you have, on the other hand, if you have somebody whose hepatitis B surface antigen level is greater than 3,000, they recommend add-on. So you're sort of, it's like you're far away from getting to functional cure. This patient needs help. So they actually recommend that you should do a PEG interferon add-on therapy for this patient for 48 weeks, and then you sort of reassess to see where you're at. Um, and then the, the group that's sort of in the middle, <laughs> they're saying, just keep on with the NA. But just so, to show us that really the field is moving towards trying to do more to get patients towards surface antigen loss, that we shouldn't be content to have them be on NAs forever, that we want to move them more and more towards either being off NAs because they have a high likelihood of getting surface antigen loss without having the NA on board, or are we going to help them with a bit of pig interferon? So for those of you that have not done pig interferon therapy in your, <laughs> in your career, um, I would say you might think about getting more comfortable with it. <laughs> All right. So in terms of PEG interferon add-on, um, there's no doubt. This is an immune modulator. It's not the best one. Obviously, the side effect profile is really not trivial. But it does increase the rates of surface antigen loss in the short term. So you can get finite benefits to your patients compared to, to NA alone. If you're going to do it, the add-on strategy is the safest and achieves equivalent rates of surface antigen loss. So switch is really not something you should do. But there's lots of areas of uncertainty here as well. For example, is 48 weeks the right amount? All the studies and the recommendation of the Apostle guidance is to use 48 weeks, but certainly I'd be interested in would 24 weeks work just as well? Um, so optimizing sort of what is the duration of pagan interferon therapy is one thing, and then what is sort of the optimal timing? So the Apostle guideline says if your hepatitis B surface angina levels over 3,000, that's your cue to think about should I think about a pagan interferon add-on strategy? Is that the right number? I think they've sort of pulled that out of a hat, honestly. That's not something that I think we have data about. So my final slide is uh, hepatitis B cure, are we close? Um, I, I hope you're getting a sense that definitely the field is moving. We, we have a lot that's coming out that's guiding us towards functional cure. Certainly the new drug therapies um, are still a few years away. We really only have a few studies that are in phase two, a few that are in phase three, but those are for Delta. Um, but I, I am so encouraged by what I see um, and seeing finite treatments coming forward where we're looking at treatments of 24, 48 weeks that get to cure. This is remarkable in terms of the way we're going to think about uh, treating our Hep B patients in the future. Uh, for those of you that are enthusiastic about pursuing functional cure now, the strategy you have available are NA withdrawal or PEG interferon add-on, and I've shared with you sort of the the modest benefits you get with those, um, they do increase your surface engine loss, but really we're not getting higher than about 15 to 20% with those strategies. And be aware, there are ALT flares, and ha having done a withdrawal trial, I can tell you they give you chest pain, those ALT flares. Um, you know, taking a patient through a flare and not treating them is really uh, tricky. So don't do it um, if you're not willing to kind of invest the very close follow-up that's needed and, and you need a patient that's very motivated to be followed very closely. But I think if you choose the right patient, that withdrawal can be undertaken safely and you can minimize risk and maximize benefits. Um, and then one final reminder is, is we really don't recommend doing withdrawal or PEG interferon therapy in those that have advanced fibrosis. That group of patients is still best served by long-term NA therapy. Thank you very much. Oh, that was wonderful. Thank you, Nora, so much. 